Thanks. Thanks so much for having me up here in Solihull. Um, you're standing to be the leader of the Green Party. Do you want to just introduce yourself to everyone who's watching? Yeah, so I'm Rosie Sexton. I'm a Green Party councillor here in Solihull. I was elected last year, 2019. I've been a member of the Green Party since 2015. Mm -hmm. And I first joined the Green Party. I think it was, it was a dawning realisation that the climate crisis was the biggest existential threat to humanity of my lifetime. It's something that if we didn't address that effectively, then very soon not much else is going to matter. Mm. And I think it, it went from there, really. You started out as a mathematician. You got a mathematics yeah, degree so, from um, Cambridge. I studied maths yeah. um, uh, and then went on and did a PhD in theoretical computer science. Yeah. And from there, I... I did the logical thing that most PhD students end up doing, <laughs> or that any PhD student might be tempted to do, which is to go off and spend 12 years as a professional fighter. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I guess you started off with, as a mathematician, but you, yeah. you, you know, you're also a mother, you've been an yeah. MMA fighter, um, you're now an osteopath and a Green Party councillor, so you're a bit more of a sort of polymath now. Um, tell, me, tell me about... Being a councillor in Solihull, um, you're um, you're part of uh, a really strong opposition of fourteen councillors yes. to the Conservatives. Yeah. What's what's that like? Um, what's that like? Sort of. What's the political territory like here? So experiences. It's really interesting. I mean, I've, I'm about the furthest, furthest thing you can find from a career politician. It's, I had absolutely no intention of getting involved in politics until I came to Solihull and I got involved with the local Green Party. Mm -hmm. And it just came up that there was a target seat in Shirley West, which is my ward, mm -hmm. and that there was a Tory councillor that we needed to get rid of, and they were looking for somebody to somebody to put in that seat. So I had some long conversations about that, and actually it didn't take an awful lot of convincing that uh, that was going to be a good thing to do. So I, I jumped in with both feet, which I think is a bit of a theme for me. That's, yeah. that's something I tend to do. Yes, yeah. yeah. And uh, I was elected. And since then, it's been a really steep learning curve mm -hmm. of figuring out how to effectively get things done. I took on the health and adult social care portfolio, which is, in terms of the council spend, it's yeah. the biggest of the portfolios because it covers an awful lot of what the council does. Yes. Um, so uh, I've been learning a lot through that about how to effectively get things done and how to make change happen in opposition via scrutiny and mm -hmm. by engaging with officers and other councillors. So it's been, it's been an interesting process. Mm -hmm. um, I think the interesting thing in Solihull is that it, it, we're quite unusual for for green groups. I mean, I think we're the second largest green group in the country and we're in a very conservative borough. So the two MPs in the borough both have five figure majorities. Right. But despite that, we've managed to carve out a real, um, a, a real space for ourselves. And that means that because Labour are effectively missing an action a lot mm. of the time, we end up talking about a lot of those social issues and around poverty and inequality and social justice and we can really own that territory and I think if you look at the what we bring in the council chamber we talk about that a lot I mean just this week we've had a council meeting we're talking about social housing we had a debate about social housing that that we put forward uh, Shaheen Ashraf who's one of our one of our councillors she proposed that and a lot of us spoke on it and I think it, it sort of really shows the, um, the breadth of our party because mm -hmm. we're not focused just on environmental issues, although we cover that as well, mm -hmm. um, but we also talk about a lot of these other wider issues that may be less obvious when you've got a group that's in a strong Labour area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've always said that the Green Party stands about the environment in the broader sense, so yes. it's not just the natural yeah. environment, but the social and cultural environment Absolutely. as well, and I guess that's And an because all of, these, all of these um, uh, ideas work together, because we can't mm -hmm. address one without the other, mm -hmm. and one of the things I'm always saying is that when you have people who are facing real issues in their day-to-day -day life of poverty and inequality and discrimination, 
it's very hard for them to think about what's going to happen to the planet in 20 years' time when they're wondering how they're going to put food on the table this week. Yeah. And yeah. I think we need to do a much better job of communicating around we're concerned about your everyday challenges, you know, the things that you're thinking about in your everyday life, as well as the future of the planet. So mm -hmm. I think we need to get those messages across and to really let people know that we're, we're there for them and we're there to fight their corner on that. Yeah, I think, you know, in the philosophical basis of the mm. Green Party document, that's, that's yes. made clear, but perhaps that's not something that, that is, um, I think, you feel is pushed, pushed much by the Green Party. I think, think a lot of it is because people come to the Green Party a lot of the time because they have those concerns around the environment. I mean, that's mm. one of the things that attracted me. Mm -hmm. I came because of that, and then I actually found that a lot of the philosophy really fitted with where I wanted to go. Mm. Okay. You know, I was very concerned about the impact of austerity and mm -hmm. so like that, and it felt like a natural home for me. I think that's something that we don't maybe communicate to the wider public as well as we could do, mm -hmm. because I think people sort of think of us. We still have that um, impression of being a single issue party. I think there are a lot of people out there who feel we're strong on the environment, they like what we're saying about the environment, but they're not confident that we're convincingly able to address all of those other issues mm -hmm. that they're concerned about. Yeah. And I think that's something that's holding us back. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your leadership mm. campaign now. Yes. So it, it seems to have come from nowhere um, <laughs> and you're relatively sort of unknown in the Green Party. Um, and it certainly caused a lot of excitement. I think there is an appetite amongst the membership for things to be sort of different. And a lot of people, myself included, uh, are, are keen to see a bit more of a contest uh, for the leadership. Um, tell us what what were the sort of key events behind your decision to put yourself forward? I think, looking at this from where I am in Solihull, mm -hmm. I think the party as a whole is at a crossroads right now. I think we've got a choice to make as to where we want to go in the future of our party. Mm -hmm. Up until now, we've been a small party and we've been really strong pressuring the bigger parties on some of the, the key issues especially around the environment. Mm -hmm. So we've been effectively a pressure group. And the work that we've done has got us to the point where we're now the, the fourth party in, in British politics. And that's no small feat, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's quite an achievement. But the question is now, do we want to take that next step towards becoming a mainstream political party and towards appealing to a wider cross-section of the public so that we can actually get the, the power we need and the influence we need, and we can get people elected into those positions where we can really make change happen. Mm -hmm. And the question is, do we want to do that? Because if we do want to do that, we have to do things differently from the way we've done them up until now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think what we need is a new approach. And sometimes people who've been deeply involved in, in something, it's hard for them to take a step back and look at it from the outside and to say, what needs to change here. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think maybe bringing a slightly different perspective to things is an advantage in that situation. Yeah. So you're going up against Shara Ali mm -hmm. and um, Jonathan Bartley and mm -hmm. Sean Berry, um, all of whom have mm -hmm. got significant experience within mm -hmm. the Green Party. And they've also, you know, been holders of um, positions, leadership, mm -hmm. leadership positions on the Green mm -hmm. Party executive before. Mm -hmm. um, and you're a relative newcomer. Yeah. Um, so tell me, why, why should Green members like me and like the people watching um, take a risk and vote for you to be the leader? I think I've got a history of being the underdog yeah. and coming into things as a relative outsider. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think I do well is to analyse a problem, to mm -hmm. figure out what needs to be done to yeah. solve that and to go and deliver on that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I've learned from my time as a councillor is that there are three key areas that we need to work on as a party. I think we need to get better at being inclusive. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that everyone who shares our values whatever group or background or walk of life they come from feels at home in the Green Party. 
and that's number one. Number two is I think we need to really work on becoming credible and to go beyond being seen as a, a party that are focused on the environment and being able to cover a wide range of different policy areas and being trusted in all of those areas. So we need to be able to speak just as confidently and passionately about criminal justice and education and foreign policy as we do about the environment. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is I think we need to prioritise and be really serious about winning elections and getting Greens elected into positions of power where we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So those are the three areas that I think we need to focus on in order to take that step up to the next level. And I think in order to do that, we need a fresh approach. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think I'm in a position to bring and I would love to have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, okay. So I guess, yeah, sometimes um, if you've been in a position of power for a mm. long time, you kind of lose that focus and you, I guess you're, you're sort of saying that you're going to bring a fresh, fresh pair of eyes to the to Absolutely. The I think being able to sort of take that outside view on the situation, yeah. it gives you a different perspective. Yeah. Okay. So I think obviously it's important to have voices from within as well and mm -hmm. I mean this is why we don't just have one person in the leadership team you know yeah. we've got the, there's deputies there's yeah. the exec yeah. it's it's a team effort yeah. and I think it's important to have a range of di mm -hmm. different voices there mm -hmm. but I think having somebody taking that leadership role who's got a different perspective and coming at it from a different place mm -hmm. I think can enable us to to do things in a different way to the way we've done them before. Yeah. And I think that's what we need to do if we want to get to yeah. where we say we want to be. I mean, yeah. we, we, we talk about, we say we're a po serious political party. We want, to be, we want to be winning elections. We want to be considered mainstream. And absolutely we should. I think we should be thinking of ourselves as a party that could be one day be in government. Mm -hmm. That's how I want to think of us. Yeah. And, I don't, and in order to do that, we need to stop behaving like a pressure group and a lifestyle movement. We need to think like a serious political party. You talk, you talk about sort of mm. working with other members of the um, Green Party executive and mm. it being a team effort. One of the things about the Green Party that's mm. maybe different from other parties is mm. that you can't sort of choose your mm. shadow cabinet, so to speak. All of, many of the positions in the Green mm -hmm. Party executive, well, all of them are elected directly by the membership. Yes. Um, how, is that an issue for you? And, you know, if you were sort of, um, would you have any sort of preference, for example, as to who you'd like to see part of your team? I, I mean, I know it's not a decision for you, it's mm. a decision for the membership, but I, mean, I guess one of the, one of the yes. great things about having yeah. a, well, one of the things about having a, a single leader is that mm -hmm. you get two deputies yeah. and there's a great mm -hmm. list of candidates. Absolutely. I mean, I do, of course, have preferences. Right. I, I wouldn't be human if I didn't. At the same time, what I'm being very clear about is that I'm not officially endorsing anyone mm -hmm. because if I were to be elected I'm going to have to work with whoever's there yeah. and I think it's important to set off on that journey on the right foot mm -hmm. so I think it would be the wrong thing for me to do to say I'd like this particular person yeah. I think it's important for a politician not to surround themselves with yes men or yes women I think groupthink is a real problem in yeah. a lot of different situations and actually I think it's a strength that the leader doesn't necessarily get to choose who they work with I think what that means is you need somebody who's going to be really strong at bringing together a diverse group of people yeah. and communicating with them and working with them and bringing them on side and setting a vision but also working with people and Guess, channeling that input mm, okay. and that's something that I think I do well yeah okay so you talk about having a diversity in the um, yes in the Green Party leadership team and you're from quite a diverse background yourself can you tell me a little bit about that yes so I'm from a mixed race background yeah. I I tick the mixed other box right. on diversity monitoring forms yeah. um, <laughs> and I think the interesting thing about being mixed race is that I've always been an outsider everywhere. Yeah. And, and that brings with it a set of experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, partly the sort of being a mixed race child growing up in a very white neighbourhood, obviously I've always felt a bit different. Even when I've not been able to put my finger on exactly where that comes from, yeah. I'm, I've been conscious of that. 
then sort of later on when I went off and studied math at Cambridge you know that was a, a very male dominated environment yes. um, mixed martial arts is obviously a very male dominated environment right. so I've sort of made a habit of being an outsider and again I think at times that's been really painful yeah because there's a human need to belong and mm. yeah we we want to find a tribe and to um to find like-minded people to to work with but at the same time I think it's also it's also a strength because it does give me that perspective of being able to communicate with lots of different groups and mm. lots of different people and n not being quite so tied to one one approach or one way of doing things mm -hmm. and yeah, we've always said in you know Hackney, where I'm mm. part of the Green Party, we we've said diversity is strength, and we yes. we are trying to sort of actively build yeah. that diversity in our in our movement, and I, it's it's uh, it's nice to hear that you've got that that sort of ethos. Um, as yes, well. I mean I think one of the important things is that we need to take a proactive approach to this. Mm -hmm. It's not enough just to root out discrimination, and one of the things I see is that there's a lot of hand wringing in the Green Party about why or why don't we ap appeal more to ethnic minority people mm -hmm. or you know why don't we have more people from a different range of backgrounds mm -hmm. and actually I think w we need to ask ourselves well what is it about the Green Party what is it about our messaging and our systems and our processes and how we do things mm -hmm. which is leading to this outcome mm -hmm. you know and how can we um how can we go and look for those voices who aren't represented and go out and find them and meet them where they are mm -hmm. and and have those conversations so it's not necessarily about getting people to join because again it's up to people whether they want to do that but we can go out and communicate with them or we can we can find out what are their challenges and their needs and you know what are they thinking about and we can bring that into the work that we do Mm -hmm. So whether they join us or not, it means we're in a stronger position to address those challenges. And I think over the longer term, that will allow us to, to build that base. But it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't and we shouldn't just be looking for brown faces to tick that diversity box. You know, I think that I feel very strongly that that is not what we're about. We need to build this from the ground up. We need to look at those underlying causes and mm -hmm. why is it that we have these challenges? So we're not just finding somebody to say, hey, look, look how diverse we are mm -hmm. and putting their face on, on leaflets and things. That's almost the opposite of what I think this should be about. Yeah. Um, um, you've talked about mm -hmm. how serious you are about electoral success. Mm -hmm. um, and you're obviously the, the official opposition here in, mm -hmm. in Solihull. And um, Solihull, as I think, within the Green Party is known as sort of being the poster child mm -hmm. of Target to Win. <laughs> um, and you've used that very effectively. And, you know, you're in this situation now where you're sort of preparing even to wrest control of the, the council from the Tories and, and, and be the, you know, lead the council. Um, but as a campaigner um, from, from Dalston, where mm -hmm. I am, where mm -hmm. I, am um, I have sort of, found some difficulties with the target to win strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I felt really uncomfortable um, with some things, for example, the sort of focus on, uh, of our electoral act activities on people who previously voted. Mm. Um, and I felt, you know, for example, following that sort of idea was missing out a huge swathe of mm. people who were predominantly, you know, were you know, black and minority ethnic people mm. were overrepresented in mm. that group. Um, and also those are the people who were sort of most likely to, to be sort of open to our campaign of, mm. or our position of radical change. Um, and, you know, so, some, some campaigners in Lambeth have even gone as far as saying that Target to Win is structurally racist um, for those reasons. And, um, and I just wanted to, you know, wanted to sort of ask you about that. And, um, you know, do you think there are, do you think we have sort of issues in the Green Party around racism? And, um, and do we need to sort of, change some of the things we do in order to confront those things? I think there are challenges here. And I think there are challenges for any political party, whether you're using a, an electoral strategy or calling it target to win or anything else. We've got the challenge that the people who tend to be most engaged with the political process tend to be people who are relatively more privileged. Mm -hmm. 
in whatever way. So in terms of socioeconomic background, in terms of racial background, um, they tend to be people who are more comfortable with, with the establishment, mm -hmm. let's say. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. That's a problem that doesn't just go through the Green Party. It goes through the whole of politics. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's something we're trying to confront as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And the question is, how do we go about addressing that? And I think that's, that's a big question. Now, in terms of Target to Win, Target to Win is specifically a strategy for winning elections. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge advantage to winning elections in that if you can get people into positions of power, it's much, much easier to make change than by hurling rocks from the outside. Mm -hmm. So once you're inside and you can have those conversations with people, I mean, there's times when I've been able to talk about structural inequality and health inequality and challenges facing black and ethnic minority communities. And I talk about these with, with council officers and I can talk about it with the media and I get listened to because I'm in a position where I can put that across. Mm -hmm. Um, so that gives me a, a lot of influence. So I think we've got to recognise that actually winning is important mm -hmm. and that there are certain strategies that allow us to do that. Um, at the same time, I also recognise that we shouldn't only be engaging with people who have previously voted. So I think it's really important that we also look at how we engage with non-voters and other me members of the ward and other groups. So we need to look for opportunities to go out and find those people and meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. um, that may not come necessarily during an election campaign, but it's absolutely something that ought to be part of our day-to-day -day work as councillors. Mm -hmm. And making sure that we're accessible to people from all different backgrounds, you know, to people who maybe aren't as... On, um, aren't as prominent on social media, you know, or don't have digital access, mm. or people who don't necessarily come and talk to their local councillor because, for whatever reason, that's not part of their their upbringing. Or, however, we look at it, we need to be going out and finding those people mm. and finding out what we can do for those communities and having those conversations. Yeah. So, I think it's vitally important that we do that. Mm -hmm. But I separate that from the isolated bit of work around election campaigns. Oh, yeah. So as a councillor, I have casework, I have portfolio work, and in all of those things, I, want, I represent every resident of that ward, whether they vote for me or not, whether they vote for anyone or not. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that I remember that. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm in that position, I can do a much better job of representing those voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I think, you know, one of the things that we've seen mm -hmm. um, with, you know, Green Party councillors, mm -hmm. some of whom have just, you know, got in by a whisker, mm -hmm. um, have seen their majorities actually increase um, mm -hmm. because um, because actually people have seen that when they get elected, they get things done yeah. and, and they, you know, they they scrutinise and they show up bad policy in, yeah. in, in councils and, and, they, and they see their majorities mm -hmm. increase for that reason. Yeah. So I guess... I mean, we know that communities tend to like having green politicians once we've persuaded them to elect us. Yeah. yeah. But I think at the same time, when we're focusing on elections, we're a small party in a first-past-the-post system. Mm -hmm. And the challenge of that shouldn't be underestimated mm -hmm. because we know that in elections, people will vote for the least bad option they think is most likely to win. Right. Yeah. That's, that, that's a fact of life. So unless we can present them with a realistic alternative and go out and say to people actually we've got a real chance of winning here mm -hmm. they're not going to vote for us mm -hmm. so our election strategy just like everything else we do needs to be based on evidence and it needs to be based on data it needs to be based on what works mm -hmm. it can't be based on wishful thinking yeah okay so it's it, it's really clear that we need to we need to do that but at the same time we also need to do the work around the diversity piece. And I kind of put those into slightly separate boxes because they're both important and they're important for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing I, I should point out about Target Twin, I think, is that, I mean, as a Green Party, we believe in, we believe in localism. Mm -hmm. We believe that solutions should be right for the community, not just imposed cookie cutter style from above. And I think that's no different with Target to Win than anything else. You know, how that looks and how it, um, 
how it functions in Hackney is going to be different from how it looks in Solihull. Mm -hmm. You know, the way we present candidates in Hackney is going to look different from the way we present candidates in Solihull. And that's just around messaging. It's around tailoring those messages to the communities that we're hoping to serve mm -hmm. and what's going to be effective in those communities. Yeah. We need to speak people's language. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about a little bit more about um, sort of internal Green Party mm. um, issues. Um, mm. You're hoping to be the leader of the, the Green Party and you've talked about sort of needing to restructure the Green Party um, to make us more effective. Um, we're obviously a democratic party and decisions mm -hmm. are made by the membership. So you're not you, you're not going to be ruling the party with an iron fist. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But how as leader will you use your influence to push for change and what, what kind of changes would you like to see? So, for example, you know, if you were elected leader this autumn, what sort of um, proposals and motions would you like to be seen debated at conference in the spring uh, to sort of move the party in, the, in, in a new direction? So I think a big one for me is that I want to look at our policy making process. Right. Now, at the moment, I think a challenge we have is that Green Party policy, the analogy I use is it's like a big pile of clothes. Right. And people keep throwing new things onto the pile without much thought about what's already there or how it fits together or whether maybe some of it is, doesn't fit us anymore or it's out of fashion or it's outdated. And I think we need to have a sort through and we need to make sure that we have a coherent, comprehensive set of policies that cover all of the different areas and that in each area we have a real focus on credibility and it being backed by experts in that field. Mm -hmm. okay. Now my view is that we need to be the party of science and evidence. We're making the case that climate change is an emergency and we need to deal with it. In order to do that credibly, I think we need to be supported by the science and the evidence and the experts in each field that we're talking about and to put that forward as this is a credible solution. Um, um, I've talked a lot about the role of politicians is to bring together values and principles on the one hand and technical expertise and science and how to get things done on the other and then to communicate that and uh, it's about leading the conversation. So it's not just about going along with what people want. It's about being at the forefront of that and communicating why we need to do things a particular way. And I accept that in a democracy, and I think that democratic element to our party is actually really important. It's a real strength and we should make the most of that. I think we need to also make sure that we have input from people who have lived experience and who or have expertise and have worked in particular fields and that they're contributing to that and I think a really good example of this and it's uh, it's interesting I'm talking to you because I think it's um, is the the Green Party drugs policy mm -hmm. I think this is a really good example of excellent policy making that worked really well and brought together a lot of different views and expertise on that and as I understand it you have, we have a lot of experts looking at that policy and going, this is absolutely the right policy. Yeah, I guess one, one of the um, things about the Green Party drug policy was, you know, I, I'm aware that legalising drugs and mm. well, legalising regulating drugs mm -hmm. is, a, is a controversial mm. controversial thing. And I, I was really surprised, actually, at how unanimous the mm. support was within the Green Party membership. And I think on reflection, part of the reason for that Mm -hmm. unanimous support was because it's so strongly supported by experts and by evidence yes um, and I think that's yeah. a real kind of um, you know it really kind of um, shows that actually yes we're democratic yes but but when you have when you have experts involved then the Green Party membership does trust those experts um, absolutely so de yes democracy in the party isn't actually a, a sort of yeah um, you know, it doesn't take away at yes. all from the policy making process and actually enhances and supports it. And I think you've just explained right there mm -hmm. what we need to have happen. Yeah, you because know, I, I think you're absolutely right that the democratic element is a really important part of that. 
but as you say, I think the fact that we've done all that, you, you've done all that other work beforehand to bring things together and to make sure that the, the, the policy was right before you put it, um, I think that, that's absolutely what we need to apply to everything. And we need to look at all of our policies in that light, mm -hmm. I think, and look at, OK, how can we get that expert input into writing the policy in the first place? Um, I mean, I always say that politicians should not be drawing up policies on the back of an envelope. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't make good policy with a Google search and, you know, a, a few good ideas. One of the things that I learned from, from studying maths is that most of the good ideas that you think you have will turn out to be wrong when you look at them more closely. Right. Yeah. Um, I think the same is true, when, especially, or it's probably even more true when we're talking about policy, because there's all manner of unintended consequences to things. Mm -hmm. And you can have something which sounds like a really good idea, but when you look at how it works in practice, actually it's not going to lead to good outcomes. And that's, that's an important principle, is that good intentions will not necessarily lead to good outcomes unless we've looked at the process. And again, you need people who have that experience and have that expertise in order to feed into that. So we need to take that principle and we need to make sure that that is consistently applied across all of our policy making. And that's what I'd be looking to do. So rather than removing the democratic element, it's more ensuring that we have input from from experts along the way. You've said that there are some areas in which you feel that we're vulnerable in, in terms mm. of policy that's maybe out of date or um, not thought through properly. Mm. Are there any particular examples of, of, of those policies which which you feel need to be mm. sort of thought, thought about so, and critiqued a little bit more? I think an obvious example is our EU policy, I think was last revised in 2017. Now, mm. There's, there's been a few developments since 2017. Right. A couple of things have happened, I think. Yeah. Um, but for anyone looking at, oh, what's the Green Party policy about the EU? That's what comes up. Yeah. So that's one example. Um, other examples, I think, there, there are some areas where we have some very specific policies that are exactly what we want to see. And there's others that are sort of very vague in general and you're not quite sure how that's going to apply. So, for example, we talk about um, children with special educational needs should receive the enhanced care that they need. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? How do we apply that in practice? Um, so I think... <sighs> When we look across the board, there are, there are areas that are very good, like I say, like the drugs policy, and there's some examples of policy that are excellent. There's some that are less so. There's some where a large proportion of experts disagree, mm -hmm. and I think that's massively problematic for us. Um, I mean, maybe we'll talk about this in a bit, but one of the most common reasons I hear for people not joining the Green Party is that our policies on things like a blanket ban on new nuclear are not supported by the experts. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe a little bit controversial and we should maybe dig into that a little bit more. Yeah. But I think it's problematic because when you have experts saying one thing and we're saying, no, we know best, mm -hmm. I think there's a difficulty there in, in getting people to trust us. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I hear from, from people on social media and things mm. is, is that our policy against HS2, for example, um, is also um, something that isn't supported mm. by, by the experts and mm. by the evidence necessarily. Um, have you got any sort of position on that? HS2, I think, is a really difficult one. So I recognise that there are huge concerns over the local environmental issues mm -hmm. and local environmental impact. Uh, the impact on local communities, there are concerns about the way the project's been carried out, and I recognise all of that. But I think we need to look at this in the context of our transport policy as a whole. Uh, we need a strategy for how we're going to completely decarbonise our transport and get people out of cars, out of planes. That's, that's absolutely critical. And at the moment, we don't have a strategy for that we have a bunch of ideas that are held together by wishful thinking. Now, I think there's a, a 
technical and slightly complicated argument about how HS2 could fit into that strategy. The argument that I've seen, and I find it quite convincing, is that HS2, by taking long distance um, fast trains off the local network, it allows us to use that local network more effectively for local services. And so that so we can, capacity, that's it, we can free up that, that local transport revolution that we keep saying mm -hmm. is, is key to, to meeting those goals. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there some, another proposal that will achieve that with lower environmental impact? And I have to say that I haven't seen anything that I find convincing in that space. I'm very, very open to, to that. So if somebody can bring one, a proposal along, that, that achieves that with lower environmental impact, of course I'm going to support it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I think the other thing that we need to think about with HS2 is actually, to a large extent, that ship has sailed. Um, whether we like it or not, whether we think it's a good thing or not, whether we support it or not, HS2 is getting built. And that the choice we have is we can continue burning up political capital in fighting mm -hmm what's ultimately a losing battle mm -hmm. on that. But that comes at an opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. So the question is, while we're talking about stopping HS2, what are we not talking about? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have said, you know, we should be, talk we should be sort of pushing for, for example, cycle routes that go along there. Yeah, along absolutely. The uh, I think that, that, I mean, there's a big piece of work to be done in how can we make HS2 better and more environmentally friendly? Mm -hmm. And how can we uh, push for a higher standard of environmental mitigation, for example? How can we push for, as you say, the, the, the cycle routes? How can we push for uh, better practice, working practices and ensuring that um, HS2 Limited are held to high standards mm -hmm. in their delivery of that? Mm -hmm. um, all of these are things that we should be focusing on. And also, what policy are we going to put in place to use that capacity which is being delivered in order to meet our environmental targets? Mm -hmm. So we know that new infrastructure on its own doesn't generate mod modal shift. You know, building HS2 will not necessarily get people out of cars. We know this. What will get people out of cars is change of policy. Mm -hmm. okay, the government has it within their gift to use it that way. Do we think the Conservatives are going to do that? Very possibly not. So we need to be pushing on that. We need to be leading on what that policy should look like mm -hmm. in order to use that capacity to meet our targets. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're not doing that because we're still shouting about stopping HS2. And as I say, I think that's the, the wrong messaging. So for me, it's not so much about whether we change our, our policy about whether we should build HS2 or not. I think where we need to go now is to say, OK, well, Given that this is happening, mm -hmm. what messaging do we have around that? How can we use our position to push for things where we're going to generate meaningful change mm -hmm. and we're going to get something, get some good outcomes? Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's the other thing that we're not focusing on while we're talking about HS2 is new road building. Mm -hmm. And whenever I say this, people say, oh, yeah, we, do, we oppose that as well. But actually, that's not coming across to the public. Mm -hmm. If you look at, for example, things that are posted on the Green Party Twitter, they've actually been a little bit better recently. But over the period we looked at, there are lots and lots of mentions of HS2 and very few, if any, mentions of, of road building projects, which are going to have a much higher environmental impact. So even if we're not completely convinced that HS2 is the right answer, actually, our messaging here is completely out of whack. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we're prioritising the wrong things, especially when you consider that if you ask people about Green Party policies, what Green Party policies do you recognise? Often the only one they'll recognise is about stopping HS2. Yeah. And the question is, why have we got that focus? So, as I say, I, I understand that there is a legitimate argument to be had over whether this is the right solution or not. Mm -hmm. And... As I say, I've seen both sides of that. Um, I appreciate the strong feelings on both sides, and I don't really want to get too stuck into, into it. Yeah. But I think what we, we should look at is how can we actually generate practical change? Yeah. Okay. And as a party, I think it's really important that we're 
putting forward constructive solutions and saying this is what we do want to see, not just this is what we don't want to see. Yeah, okay. And that's a, I guess that's a reflection of your position in Solihull Council is that you're preparing for leadership rather than just yeah. throwing stones from the So yeah. in Solihull, we're presenting ourselves as, as an administration in waiting. Mm -hmm. you know, we want to run the council. We're putting that out to people. Is, and that's a completely different ask. When you go to people on the doorstep and say, we want you to vote for us so we can be a strong local voice for the ward and we can push on local issues and we can criticise the administration, that's one thing. When you go to them and say, we want you to vote for us so that we can run the council, mm -hmm. that's a different ask. Mm -hmm. And in order to make that ask, we need to present ourselves as competent and credible and having real solutions to things. We can't just oppose things. We have to say, this is what we do instead. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that, that, that's a lesson that we're learning locally. And it's something that I'd really like to take to a national level mm -hmm. is saying, right, what do we want to see instead? Mm -hmm. How are we going to, how are we going to put this message across yeah. to people? One of the things you've talked about um, a lot is, is the need to sort of um, increase and diversify our, mm -hmm. our, our base uh, of members. Mm -hmm. um, and we are growing as a political party and that's something that Jonathan and Sean have overseen mm. effectively in the, in the past. Um, we're now sort of in a, a, a sort of transformational mm -hmm. phase of, of politics. We've left the EU mm -hmm. um, and particularly Labour have now got a new leader and they're changing mm -hmm. direction. Um, mm -hmm. They've really sort of taken a very sharp turn to the right. Yes. And many Labour activists, particularly people who have been uh, really active campaigners are now feeling very disillusioned and homeless politically. Mm -hmm. um, and many are considering joining the Green Party. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the Greens are, is a sort of, do you think the Green Party is the natural home for people on the left of politics? I'm always a bit wary about this because I think the more we position ourselves in relation to Labour, the more we buy into their territory. So when we talk about where we are compared to the Labour Party, we're sort of accepting their position as the, the major party and, you know, we're the, um, we're the satellite. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think we should re reject that framing altogether, actually. I think left-right politics is, is quite limiting. You know, it, there's a lot of talk about, well, you know, are we on the left of Labour or are we on the right of Labour? I would say we're in a different space altogether from Labour actually. Now, when people talk about being left of Labour, what they usually mean is we care deeply about issues of poverty and inequality and social justice. And absolutely, I think that's true. I think that's a really important value for the Green Party. However, I think what we propose as solutions and how we go about delivering that is fundamentally different mm -hmm. from what is proposed by Labour. Um, I think our focus on localism and local communities and community engagement is quite different from what we see coming out of Labour. And I think that's an important distinction that we need to make. So it's not as simple as saying left or right. There's, there's a lot more dimensions to politics than left and right. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see ourselves uh, finding our own voice and not just positioning ourselves in terms of the, the two establishment parties. Because especially going forwards, you know, in the future, we're going to need new solutions. Mm -hmm. We can't look back at what's worked in the past and rehash that because our situation is completely different. You know, we've got a whole set of new challenges. We've got climate change. We've got COVID. We've got a situation in terms of technology that's available to us that is very, very different from anything we've seen before. We've got a changing work environment for people. Mm -hmm. So we're in a whole new world here. Mm -hmm. And I think looking back to the past and saying we want a solution that's been developed, you know... The, um, been developed or, under a different... Yes, a different we, look, 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 looking, different that's it. Looking back to the past for solutions that, that come from a previous era... Yeah. if you like. And I think this is one of the things uh, with a lot of what I see in Labour is a lot of it is looking back to the past. It's yeah. saying, you know, how can we recreate this situation that we had? Yeah. Um, and I don't think we can. 
yeah. you know, we need we need something different to go forward. We need a new solution, yeah. not an old solution. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of talk about how we're going to um, reconceptualize our economic system for the future. Mm -hmm. And this idea that the challenge we're facing is how to maximize human well-being on a finite planet. Mm -hmm. And how how are we going to tackle that problem? And that's something that, again, looking back, this is this is something we've never really addressed before. Because in the past, we were always talking about economic growth mm -hmm. and how do we generate economic growth. And that's something that both Labour and the Conservatives are still fixated on. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, the question is, say, well, actually, it's not so much about economic growth. It's about maximising well-being. Mm -hmm. And that may or may not involve an element of economic growth, but what we need to look at is how we do that in the context of a finite resources and a finite world. Mm -hmm. So actually, I think we need some new thinking and new solutions, not just putting ourselves on that same spectrum mm -hmm. that we've talked about previously. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, a lot of politicians like to sort of label mm. themselves in terms of what, what their p political ideology or philosophy mm. is. Um, and you've talked a lot about social mm. justice and made yeah. that a focus of your mm -hmm. work in the council, but also, yeah. you know, you've said that that's a, a focus of what you want to look at when you're, when you're a leader and, and in the direction that you change the party. Um, um, because you're interested in social justice, would you, would you give yourself the label of a socialist? Or, or do you see, again, that... Time's moved on and it's time for sort of new definitions. And I don't like labels. History. I don't like labels for a few reasons. I think this comes from my notion of, of always being an outsider. You know, again, the whole, whenever I'm asked about the race question, it's like, well, what am I? I, I don't know. I, I haven't thought about it. I think as soon as you put a label on something, you put yourself in a box. Mm -hmm. And that's limiting. You know, it might be a, it might be a large box, but it's still a box. And the other thing is, when you put a label on something, other people have a preconception of what that label means. Mm -hmm. And socialist is one of those words that means different things to different people. And whether we like it or not, most people don't have the same dictionary definition of, of, of socialist. And we can have an argument about political philosophy all day, but as somebody who's been out on the doorsteps talking to people, that's not the place for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you go to people and you say, I'm a socialist, immediately that's going to turn a lot of people off. Those people may share 90% of your values and they may be very happy with the work that you do and what your priorities are. But because you put that label on it, suddenly they're not interested. Mm -hmm. So I think labels are limiting. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'd, I want to get away from that, because we need to find a solution that's going to work for people going forward. We need a new label, mm -hmm. if you like. And I don't know what that label's going to be. That's not my job. I want to work out what those solutions are going to look like mm -hmm. and how we're going to bring people on board with those and how we're going to address people's concerns. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's much more of a dynamic situation. And that's, sort of, that's how I approach everything. You know, I think, I mean, my background in mixed martial arts, it's not about, you know, I... When we're looking at people that have argue, long arguments over, oh, is this a judo technique or a jiu-jitsu technique? It's like, I don't care. Does it work? Yes. Great, let's use it. Yeah. And in the same way, you know, I, I don't particularly want to have long arguments about political philosophy and say, oh, is this a socialist idea or not? Mm -hmm. You know, do we like the idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, does it, does it fit with our values? Mm -hmm. you know, does it... Um, lead to a, a fairer society with more human well-being. Mm -hmm. yeah, great, let's let's go for it. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of that, that's my approach to politics, mm -hmm. rather than looking at looking at labels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we in the Green Party are up mm -hmm. against a first past the post system. Yeah. Um, if you look across the world at um, countries where first past the post is used, mm -hmm. Green parties have only ever got elected in five constituencies, um, three in Canada, yeah. one in Australia, yeah, yeah. and then Brighton mm -hmm. Pavilion here in the UK. Yes. Um, how do you go about sort of um, uh, addressing this, this challenge? Um, 
are we sort of are we are you sort of preparing us for somehow getting rid of first past the post and going to proportional representation, or do you think we can do what the SNP did in Scotland and pull off a sort of a, a whole scale, um, you know, victory under first past the post? Um, which of those mm. two directions do you think we should uh, look towards? Both. I absolutely think that we should be campaigning for PR. It's long overdue. It would make a huge difference to politics in this country, even aside from making it easier for, for Greens to get elected. Mm -hmm. I think it would change the whole tone of the discourse and the debate, yeah. I think, for the better. Mm. So I think it's massively important that we do that. However, I don't think we should hold our breath waiting for it to happen, because at the moment, I'm not seeing an obvious path to that happening anytime soon. Mm. In, order, in order to have PR, we need a party that wins power to back it. Mm -hmm. And... As I say, at the moment, Labour don't seem to be prepared to commit to that. Yeah, I think. And they're not in power. So um, what we need to be focusing on is how do we win on our own terms without relying on other parties to do that for us. So I think at the moment we need to put on hold, put to one side the idea of PR. I mean, I fully support campaigns like Make Votes Matter. I, I'm... I, I regularly share things that they put out and I think, again, you know, winning that, that debate is important. But at the same time, we need to be strategising. We need to say, this is the system that we're facing, these are the rules that we've got, whether we like it or not, how do we win under these rules? Mm. And you said, for example, that we need, a sec we need to get a second MP elected. Yeah, absolutely. Where do you think he or she or they are coming, coming from? That's a good question. And that's a question that I think should be answered by data, not my opinion, right. or not anyone else's opinion. I think we need to look at a data-driven strategy. Mm -hmm. We need to look at um, an evidence-based strategy. Mm -hmm. I mean, and evidence-based matters when it comes to electoral uh, our electoral politics, just as it does With when we're talking about anything else in the policy making. Yeah. So. I know that there is work going on mm -hmm. to, to figure that out and to figure out what that strategy should look like. Yeah. As leader, what I want to say is let's prioritise that. Let's prioritise that evidence-driven work. Let's do more of it mm -hmm. and let's have the discipline to stick to us that strategy once mm -hmm. we have it. Yeah. yeah. With, with the first-past-the-post system, some people have said that actually the most influence that we have is around those marginal constituencies mm. where... Um, where actually the, the sort of difference is made between Tories and Labour. Mm. Um, um, and, um, you know, in the last election, the Green Party had some quite high, high profile campaigns in marginal constituencies, mm. which were very controversial. Um, yet in other marginals, um, we, we actually stood, get, stood down candidates or, or stand, mm. candidates who were selected stood down mm -hmm. um, in order to allow a, a, a Labour um, mm. Uh, a progressive Labour Party yeah. uh, candidate to, to fare better against the Tories. Yeah. What were your opinions about that? And do you think that we should sometimes be sort of playing hardball with Labour and standing in marginal constituencies? Or do you think we should, you know, have this, you know, share this, get out the Tories? Um, I think the question to ask is, what are we trying to achieve? Yeah. And that's going to vary on a case by case basis. Yeah. So the question is, is, is this the right strategy? Well, we've got to start with, well, what's... What's our outcome measure? What are we looking to, to do? Because until we know that, we don't know whether it's the right strategy or not. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I worry about is that there is a lot of thrashing about without a clear goal in mind. Yeah. And say, well, are we just trying to get noticed? Are we trying to get media coverage? Are we trying to pressure the major parties? Are we trying to get them to adopt our policies? Are we trying to get elected? Because all of those things come with a different strategy. Mm -hmm. So we need to be clear about that, first of all. And as I say, I think there's arguments for each of those. Part of it's going to depend on whether we're happy with our position as a minor party and a pressure group, or whether we want to try and make that transition to being one of the major parties. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, for me, the crux of the debate. Um, yeah. And that's the crux of what we're, we're looking at. Mm -hmm. In this leadership campaign but also you know going into the future mm -hmm. it's where do we want to be do we want to be at the table or do we want to be outside the door shouting mm -hmm. okay 
Um, one of the, um, so a, a colleague of mine in Hackney was at a meeting mm -hmm. where um, the, the leader of the Solihull Council, so it's a conservative politician, mm -hmm. Uh, was talking about climate change mm. and, and they were actually quite surprised about how eloquent um, your mm -hmm. sort of opposition leader uh, sort yeah. of, well your, your, your le council leader was about climate change and, um, and this was sort of attributed to the fact that he's got a very strong green opposition. Do you buy the argument that actually we've got a lot of power um, as you know in opposition um, I guess sort of soft power in the political process or, yes, absolutely. or do you think we should sort of disregard that and just go for the hard power of being elected and being able to make executive decisions? So I think the reason that we have power is because we are elected mm -hmm. and because we're a serious threat. We're, we're, we're a credible opposition and because of that they take, they take notice. Mm -hmm. You know, If we were a, a small party with one or two councillors, would they be talking the same way? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Solihull Conservatives are terrified that we're going to take the council from them. Mm -hmm. they that, that, that is a real threat to them, that the Greens are going to take over. And because of that, we, the, the, the whole tone of the, the debate around climate change and the environment has changed. Mm -hmm. um, we ne we're now in a situation where Conservative councillors are falling over themselves to be greener than the Greens. Mm -hmm. Which is great because actually it means that things get done. Mm -hmm. You know, we can put things forward and regardless of who gets to take credit for that, and, you know, it means that things are happening mm -hmm. and that we're actually getting real meaningful change. And we're getting that from a position of opposition because we've made them feel threatened. Mm -hmm. Now, as I say, do I think that would be happening in the same way if we were just making the arguments as a pressure group? No, I don't. So I think it's certainly possible to use opposition, but in order to use opposition effectively, you need to be a credible threat. We need to present ourselves as an administration in waiting, mm -hmm. not just a pressure group. And I think that's the, that's the real key to it. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, when I go into meetings as the opposition portfolio holder for health and adult social care, I'm there to present an alternative. It's like, if I was running this portfolio, what would it look like? Mm -hmm. And when I talk to council officers and when I talk to the media about it and when I make comments on, on policies that have been put, my thinking is, what would this look like if I were running it? Mm -hmm. And again, that puts a certain amount of pressure. So when I talk about health inequality, that gets written into reports. Mm -hmm. You know, Officers know that I'm going to ask them about the health inequality impact mm -hmm. certain things. So they've thought about it before it comes to the meeting. They've mm -hmm. thought about it when they're drafting the policy and when they're drafting the report because they know they're going to get quizzed on it. Mm -hmm. And that happens because I'm at that table. Mm -hmm. So that's the importance of being elected. And mm -hmm. this is why I keep saying that actually, yes, we can make a lot of noise and we don't necessarily need to be the party in power mm -hmm. in order to run things. People think it's all about who gets to pass motions and things like that. Actually, a relatively small proportion of politics is down to passing motions. A lot of it gets done with soft power. Mm -hmm. And, and for example, you know, when I have conversations with people um, and we'll talk about particular areas and I'll ask them questions about why are we doing this mm -hmm. and get people thinking along certain lines, that changes the debate changes what gets thought about and talked about and what gets done mm -hmm. and it, I mean that's a really good example where he said that actually the Solihull Conservatives talk a good game on the environment but they've been pushed there mm -hmm. that hasn't happened of their own accord. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about some specific controversial issues within the Green Party um, we've spoken about one of them we've spoken mm -hmm. about HS2 yeah. the other thing of course is trans rights mm -hmm. um, now you've come out on Twitter saying that you think that trans men are men and trans women are women and um, non-binary people are valid, um, which is which is fantastic. Um, do you um, specifically do you support reforming the Gender Recognition Act so that trans people call, or anyone can um, can choose their or determine their own gender? The short answer to that is yes. Yeah. Um, the slightly longer answer. I absolutely reject this idea that this is about 
uh, trading off different rights between different groups. Yeah. Um, I don't think we should ever be doing that. Yeah. I think our job as politicians is to look at how we can create better solutions that work for everyone, that work for our whole community and that bring people together rather than dividing them. Yeah. So for me, inclusivity is a really important value mm -hmm. and I want the Green Party to be a place where everyone who shares our values mm -hmm. can feel at home, mm -hmm. whatever their background mm -hmm. and um, whoever they are, yeah. whoever they love, you know, whatever their gender, race, any other characteristics. I want them to feel at home here. Yeah. So the important place to start from, I think, is that trans people receive an immense amount of abuse mm -hmm. and marginalisation mm -hmm. um, in society as a whole. Yeah. And you can see this on, on social media all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that we come out strongly and say that this is absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, this should not happen. Um, the problem that we've got is that there's been a lot of misinformation about what the GRA actually says mm -hmm. and what the implications of that are going to be. Sure. And I think because of the misinformation that's been put out there, and I think a lot of that misinformation is agenda driven, it's, mm -hmm. it's not in good faith, a lot mm -hmm. of it, but a lot of people have heard that and that's caused a certain amount of anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of campaigners, so, for example, have said that you know, if you have self-ID, then, yeah. then that will make women's spaces less safe from predators. Would you buy that argument? Or do you think there's anything in that argument? Or I don't think that's the case. Because, I mean, as I understand it, we have the Equality Act, which already makes exemptions for certain cases where there are single-sex bases for a legitimate reason. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, nobody's actually campaigning to change that element of it. Mm -hmm. And actually, the GRA wouldn't affect that anyway. Mm -hmm. Because in a lot of these cases, um, the GRA is just about what it says on your birth certificate. Mm -hmm. And actually, what it says on your birth certificate doesn't affect access to a lot of these spaces. You know, I mean, public toilets, for example. People say, oh, the GRA would mean that uh, uh, trans women can use public to uh, women's toilets. It's like, well, actually, that's already the case. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And... And many, Nobody many checked do. my birth certificate last time I used the toilet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of confusion about what the GRA actually says. Um, what it actually is, is a way for trans people to um, change those documents which gives them certain legal protections and legal rights. And that's really important because I, do I think that somebody should be forced to go through... Um, quite a an uncomfortable potentially traumatic sort of very medicalized process mm -hmm. in order to have those rights no i don't no um mm -hmm. so i think this idea that this is going to have a huge impact on women's rights is is simply not the case people like to bring up um specific situations and things and i think in in the vast majority of those cases the answer is actually we need appropriate safeguarding whatever people's gender is mm -hmm. You know, so people talk about women's prisons. Well, in women's prisons, we high-risk um, offenders, we need risk assessments and safeguarding around them. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what their gender is or their sex is or uh, their anatomy, that's not the point. You know, the point is, are they a risk? Mm -hmm. Okay, we need to put appropriate measures in place. Mm -hmm. And... You're going to say evidence again, aren't you? <laughs> we need this to be done by people who have experience of working in these environments yeah. with appropriate evidence from experts, it's not something mm -hmm. that we should be deciding from the comfort of our living room mm -hmm. based on a Google search. Mm -hmm. sure. you know, so I think it's, it is a complex issue. And the, the problem is a lot of the people who have, I'm going to say sort of more genuine concerns and anxieties around this, those concerns are due to some of that misinformation mm -hmm. um, and it's become really hard to tell the difference between that and some of the nasty transphobic dog whistling mm -hmm. that goes on yeah. and some of that is really unpleasant so I put, try and put myself in in the shoes of somebody who's trans and I mean when I commented about this on Twitter the other day I think within the space of half an hour I had a whole pile of 
often quite nasty comments from people who were being really quite unpleasant about it. And all I'd done was, was mention trans rights. Now, if you're trans, that follows you around. For me, it's something I can pick up and put down. You know, I can I can walk away from that debate if I choose to. For somebody who's trans, they can't do that uh -huh. because it's about who they are. Uh -huh. And I think it's unacceptable that we should put those people in an environment where they're constantly feeling obliged to justify their existence uh -huh. effectively. And they're constantly having to have that argument with people. And every time trans rights gets mentioned, you know, someone brings up women's prisons or sport or, you know, the, one of these set piece arguments about, it's like, we don't want to talk about that. Uh -huh. You know, we, we're simply talking about the rights of those people to um, live an ordinary life and to be present and to participate in, in our institutions and in society you know, and, and to use the toilet. Yeah. Um, that's the important thing here if for me. Is, uh, and we, we need to be supportive of that, mm -hmm. I think. Um, as I say, I'm also a very strong supporter of women's rights. You know, I think there's a lot of work to be done around um, violence against women, domestic violence, all of these issues. And I'm really serious about that. I mean, again, in my work as a counsellor, this is something that I've highlighted with officers and it's something that I've uh, um, I've brought up many times mm -hmm. is, is our work against domestic violence. So I think that's really important, but I think this idea that the two are somehow at odds mm -hmm. is disingenuous. Mm -hmm. okay. I reject that. Yeah. I want to talk about where we are really with the mm -hmm. struggle against the climate emergency. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a lab Labour leader now who seems to be rolling back on um, mm -hmm. on Labour's climate commitments mm -hmm. and we've got a recovery from the lockdown that seems to be going back to business as usual again. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of environmentalists are feeling, you know, in disarray because mm. the opportunity or the political opportunity of the lockdown to implement change in our mm -hmm. society to take action on the climate emergency seems to be passing. Mm. Um, Extinction Rebellion's next instalment is on the 1st of, uh, 1st of September, um, but a lot of people are saying that it's likely that that won't get so much airtime um, and it'll be a smaller movement than, than before. What can be done to sort of really get the climate and get the ecological emergency back into the main frame? Um, and how would you go about doing that as leader of the Green Party? Yeah. So I've said that we shouldn't be a pressure group. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that's our role. I think it's our role to be an effective political voice of the Green Movement. That doesn't mean that I don't think pressure groups are, are worthwhile, because on the contrary, I think they're really important. And actually, I think the, the pressure groups out there, you know, people like Friends of the Earth and um, Greenpeace and XR, I think they do a really vital job in getting through to the public consciousness the, the importance and the urgency of doing something about this. So I think they've absolutely got a role to play in that as well. Um, as I say, I, th I think our role is a bit different. Um, and I think that's entirely appropriate, but there's, there's space for, for both approaches. Now, in terms of how we make change, this is a really difficult problem because at the moment we've got a Conservative government who are really showing no serious interest in uh, making the change that we need to happen. You know, they're paying lip service to, to what needs to be done. And there's every sign that, that Labour are going this... Well, I think you're absolutely right that Labour have rolled back on, on some, of their, some of their manifesto commitments, some of their previous commitments. So how we change that, that's, that's a difficult problem. Um, and I'm not sure that I have any very easy answers. As I say, I think we need to keep talking about it. And the one thing that, I mean, I do take a small amount of comfort from is that this is, it's much more on everyone's lips these days. Mm -hmm. And across the political spectrum, people are more often talking about climate change and what needs to be done. And that isn't a lot of the time translating into effective action, mm -hmm. but we're having those conversations. Mm -hmm. So it's progress of a sort, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. It's not anywhere near enough. Um, the way I see this is that 
in order to push the case on the environment, in, or, in order to ch change um, what's happening in the environment, we need to present ourselves as a serious alternative. Mm -hmm. And that, that goes across the board. We need to, people to think, yes, we could trust the Greens to run the country. Mm -hmm. That's where I want to go as a party. I want people to look at us and think, that's who I want in government. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're not there yet. And we've got a long way to go. And I, paradoxically, I think we get there by focusing on things that aren't just climate change. You know, we need to keep strong on that. We need to absolutely stick to that value. And we need to make sure that we're leading the way when it comes to the environment. But we also need to be competent and credible on everything else mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And that's how we'll get that influence in order to make that change. So I think from our point of view, as a political party, that's the way we, we go about things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we can still push in terms of the, the recovery from COVID. I think there's... Um, there are still really strong arguments to be made about change going forwards. I, I see what's being said, that that window of opportunity is closing. And I think realistically that was always going to happen under our current administration. I think the idea that this was going to result in a massive change in how we do everything, I thought that was, that was a bit unrealistic mm -hmm. at first. So... I think there, there are opportunities there, but we're going to have to be, again, targeted and specific mm -hmm. and push those constructive, specific solutions forward mm -hmm. and, and get people behind them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One of the things that Extinction Rebellion in particular have been really mm -hmm. pushed, pushing for, and something that's got a lot of evidence backing it up, mm -hmm. is, is to do away the, with the whole um, political system and have uh, citizens' assemblies to mm -hmm. make decisions. Um, is this something that you're prepared to, as a Green Party leader, endorse? Um, if, you know, as you say, that, that there's good evidence for it, is this something that you'd be open to? I really like the idea of citizens' assemblies. Um, I don't necessarily see this as an either or. I don't think we necessarily need to be campaigning to do away with politics altogether. I think there are ways to introduce citizens' assemblies within and as an extension of what we already do mm -hmm. and I think a lot of it depends on how we go about that because there's, a, there's there's absolutely a really strong argument for doing that around specific hot button issues where there's a lot of um, controversy around mm -hmm. one particular topic for example what happened in Ireland and absolutely uh, yes yeah. I, I think that was a really good example and I think Again, there, there are other examples, certainly, where we could look at that in the UK. Mm -hmm. Do I think we should be pushing to abolish the political system altogether? I think that's maybe too big a step. Mm -hmm. I think we don't get from here to there by throwing this out and starting again. Um, I think we can absolutely look at how we should reform our political system. And there, there are some relatively... Um, manageable reforms that we we could be pushing for that actually as you say are, are very evidence-based that w would achieve quite a lot mm -hmm. and we could really get some some public support for because I, I think there's a lot of disillusionment with the with the current system that we have mm -hmm. so so yes I, I I'm, I'm supportive of citizens assemblies I'm not supportive of framing it as a let's throw everything out and start again mm -hmm because I don't think that comes across as credible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think sort of a wholesale um, reworking. And again, not least because I don't see a path to get there. Mm -hmm. Because if you're asking a, a political party that's in power to legislate, to do away with that whole system and replace it with the Citizens' Assembly... It's like I'm not circus to vote for Christmas. Isn't yeah, it? I'm, not, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Yeah. So I'm not sure that that's the most effective use of our influence mm -hmm. but if we're saying let's use these as well and let's maybe increase the um, uh, the emphasis that's given to public participation in that decision making mm -hmm. process absolutely let's yeah. do that okay um you've, you've you've obviously got a lot of um life experience um to mm -hmm. bring to the role of green party leader and um, one of the things you spent a lot 
a lot of time focusing on, in, on his mixed martial arts and there are some crazy mm -hmm. videos of of you on YouTube, which, yeah, which yeah, yeah. Uh, may be slightly different to this one. I wouldn't necessarily recommend Googling them. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind of um, relevance, if any, does that have on your on who you are as a person and maybe some of the skills and some of the mm. things that you would bring to your role as Green Party leader? I learned an awful lot from my mixed martial arts career. Yeah. And I think it's an unusual background for a politician, but actually I think it's a really good one in a lot of ways. I think mm -hmm. there are a lot of transferable skills yeah. um, and not just dealing with <laughs> Twitter <laughs> pylons. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that my MMA career gave me, uh, I mean, firstly experience dealing with media yeah. and sort of putting myself forward and being in the in the spotlight which is something I'm mean, growing up as a very nerdy kid um, who wasn't always comfortable in my own skin I think that in itself was was a really important mm -hmm. lesson an important skill to develop but I think also there's something important to be learnt from the ability to stand up for, for their values and principles and what they mm -hmm. believe in. Yeah. And sometimes that's scary. You know, sometimes you're doing that in a context where you know you're going to get shouted down, you know it's not going to go well, and you've got to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think being able to recognise that fear and that... Um, and confront that. Legitimate... Yeah. Yeah, as I did, that actually, yeah, this could go really badly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even putting myself forward as leader.